This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The UN says the Burkina Faso massacre in which 130 people were killed was carried out by child soldiers. Southern African countries to deploy troops to Mozambique's Cabo Delgado in the latest effort to end an insurgency there. And as a third wave sweeps through Africa, Africa's CDC warns that the continent is not winning the fight against COVID-19. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivia. Here with the latest in business is Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in business news. In business, South Sudan has rolled out its first oil licensing auction with five blocks on offer. And the high cost of food is pushing 7 million Nigerians deeper and deeper into poverty. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs. But Thanks for that, Rama. We begin this news hour in Burkina Faso, where the government and the UN say that a massacre in which 130 people were killed early this month was carried out mostly by child soldiers. According to government spokesperson Wasseni Tambura, the child soldiers involved in that attack were between the ages of 12 and 14. On the evening of June the 4th, the armed assailants are reported to have raided the village of Solan, where they set homes on fire and shot residents. UNICEF has, in a statement, reiterated its condemnation of the recruitment of children as fighters. The Southern African Development Community, or SADC, has agreed to deploy forces to help end an insurgency in Mozambique's Cabo Delgado. The agreement was made at a one-day summit held in Maputo on Wednesday, while key discussions at the meeting included regional integration, cooperation and development. Topping the agenda was a fight against terrorism in Mozambique. Over the past three years, militants have intensified violence. They've seized control of towns and villages while killing hundreds of people. Thousands have been forced to flee their homes. The number of troops to be deployed, along with the timeline of their deployment, has not yet been made public. Mozambique in prison, Felipe Nusi says his hope is for peace to return to Cabo Delgado. Our analysis must take into account terrorist cells scattered in the region. Conscious that securing success in the fight against this scourge means safeguarding our cultural and economic values and our sovereignty. Our approach rests on the basis that terrorism is a global threat and if we want to defeat it, we must further our understanding with the prospect of eradicating it from our entire region. I would like to assure you that in Mozambique, we are deeply aware of our responsibilities at the present moment. The increase of violence against aid workers in the Central African Republic continues to be a grave concern for the UN the briefing, the UN briefing Security Council on Wednesday, the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in the country said that 225 incidents of violence against aid workers had been recorded in the first five months of this year. All this in a country where the UN reports that over 2 million people are suffering from high and surging acute food insecurity. The UN says that the widespread attacks are negatively impacting the ability of its peacekeeping mission in the CAR. Militants from the Coalition of Patriots for Change are largely blamed for the violence. I remain concerned about the negative consequences generated by the military counteroffensive of the defense and security forces and the bilateral forces and other security personnel to destroy the guerrillas imposed by the CPC. We are currently living in the center and northwest of the CAR an asymmetrical war with the armed groups of the CPC mainly responsible for serious violations of human rights. This has resulted in an unprecedented humanitarian crisis with new waves of displacement and 57% of the population requiring humanitarian assistance. The current security context also does not spare humanitarian actors who are working to alleviate a crisis exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic the violence of the CPC and the operations against it. The number of internally displaced persons has reached an unprecedented level since 2014. 
forced evictions of internally displaced persons even took place in early June at a core raising site in Bambari, a place protected by international humanitarian law. In Madagascar, communities in the southern part of the country are on the verge of starvation. This is according to the World Food Program, which reports that women and children walk for hours to reach food. The crisis is part of the aftermath following the worst drought Madagascar has seen in 40 years. Back in the month of May, reports had indicated that over a million people in Madagascar faced dire food shortages. Now, according to the WFP, acute malnutrition has almost doubled in the last four months. The food program says it requires almost $79 million to help avert a humanitarian crisis. It's seven times worse than it was just a year ago. Seven times more children are in trouble. Why? Because of drought. We're facing the worst drought in over 40 years. And this is an area where people depend on their own agriculture, homegrown school meals, smallholder farmers. This is how they live down here, but with drought back to back to back, people can't survive. And so the government partnering with the World Food Program and others, we're doing the best we can, but it's a terrible situation. Let's head over to North Africa where Algeri Algerian media is reporting that Prime Minister Abdelaziz Gerard has stepped down. This follows legislative ex elections which were held earlier this month. This opens a door for the president to name a new cabinet. The country's incumbent, na incumbent National Liberation Front won the most seats in the vote on June the 12th. Polls, however, saw a low turnout, a no majority winner. The new government is faced with the challenge of tackling a financial and economic crisis due mainly to a fall in oil prices. Well, over in East Africa, at least 10 Kenyan soldiers have been killed in a helicopter crash in the Kajiado County on the outskirts of the capital, Nairobi. The Kenya Air Force aircraft was carrying 23 soldiers who were traveling for a training exercise when it plummeted to the ground on Thursday morning. Soldiers who were wounded in the accident were airlifted to a military hospital in Nairobi for treatment. The cause of the accident is yet to be established. On matters relating to the coronavirus, the Africa CDC says countries on the continent are not winning the fight against COVID-19. Africa CDC Director John Kerasong made these remarks on Thursday. A third wave is being reported by at least 20 African countries. Countries on the continent continue to struggle to gain access to sufficient vaccine doses for their populations. The COVAX program, co-led by the World Health Organization, has lagged behind in its aim to ensure fair distribution of vaccines to poor countries. Just over 1% of Africa's population has been fully vaccinated. Meanwhile, an African startup will soon start producing the continent's first COVID-19 vaccine. Afrigen Biologics, which was picked by the World Health Organization for a pilot to give poor and middle-income countries the technology and licenses to make COVID-19 vaccines. The company based in South Africa says it has the capacity to produce 10,000 vials daily. Here's CDTN's Wanja Mugai with the details. Africa is set to start manufacturing its own vaccines in the fight against COVID-19. This follows World Health Organization's license and establishment of a hub to realize the dream. Afrigen Biologics, a tech startup based in South Africa's Western Cape, now awaits a verdict on which company to partner with during production. The WHO and partners are in, in discussions with technology partners. Uh, we believe that, that by middle July those discussions will be completed. A delegation will visit South Africa uh, in the week of the 19th of July, at which time we will then start officially the process to prepare for tech transfer. We hope, and the target is that in 12 months from tech transfer agreements being signed, we will have the first vaccine candidate into clinical trials, either for breaching studies or phase one clinical trials. The continent's first vaccine will be made using the mRNA technology that entails a close to digital approach. The messenger ribonucleic acid vaccine acts by increasing protein translation by injecting genetic code which instructs a patient's cell to construct a part of the virus triggering the body to build immunity. Scientists say it's one of the fastest vaccine solutions so far and has been adopted by Pfizer and Moderna vaccines producers. This is the first step 
for us in Africa to establish cutting edge novel technology vaccine production suitable for fast track rapid response and to ensure that we have vaccine security on this continent. The hub hopes to produce between 30 and 50 million doses for Africans. They also hope to adjust its demand for super cold storage into normal temperatures between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. The first ever African vaccine could save Africa from the wrath of a fresh surge of COVID-19 infections, which the World Health Organization has warned poses a threat for a third wave on the continent. The Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has recorded over 5 million cases and about 140,000 deaths in Africa so far. Wanjamungai, CGTN. Uganda is to close its parliament for two weeks as the country battles to control the spread of COVID-19. Parliament authorities say more than 100 of its staff, including members of parliament, tested positive for the coronavirus. Here's CDTA's Michael Baleka with the details. A statement released by parliament indicates that 14 legislators tested positive for the virus, but all the cases did not show any signs and symptoms that require hospitalization. The Parliament Communications Office says the closure of the Parliament House for two weeks is a precautionary measure taken for the safety of everyone. More than 1,000 people congregate at Parliament daily and they believe the area could easily become a hot spot. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health has handed out more than 5,000 mosquito nets to market vendors to protect them from a possible malaria outbreak. Uganda's President Jerry Museveni recently ordered for a countrywide shutdown to control the spread of the COVID-19 infections. But food markets were allowed to operate on condition that traders do not go home. During COVID, mosquitoes are not locked down. They are not in a quarantine. In fact, there is even more transmission because people are at home. Fortunately, this wave came when we moved around and gave mosquito nets for all homes in Uganda. But what we have also done, our village health team and community health workers, because people cannot drive to facilities, we have armed them with equipment and we have given them PPE to be able to treat people within communities. Uganda is battling a more aggressive second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The country is recording about 1,000 new cases per day. Health officials have warned of more deaths due to limited hospital beds and decreasing oxygen supplies. My Kobalekesi GTN, Kampala, Uganda. Mauritius has introduced new COVID-19 regulations which came into effect earlier this week. Under the Mauritius Quarantine Act, unvaccinated individuals who are over the age of 18 will be prohibited access to all education and medical facilities. If all goes well in the country's vaccination drive, most students will be able to return to school on the 5th of July. Here is CGCN's Liu Feifei with more. Mauritius is recognized as a best practice model for COVID-19 response in Africa and worldwide. Now the country is gearing up for the next phase of opening up through the new requirement that all adults need to be vaccinated in order to have access to educational and medical facilities. Now, the opening of the school is shortly and with that, with this regulation in place, now already more than 90% of the personnel having been vaccinated. So that means that our children will be able to go to school safely. This is welcome news for students, parents and educators alike. Since early March, all schools have remained closed due to a second wave of COVID-19 transmissions. So the idea behind this uh, legislation is to ensure that our children in school are protected and the school personnel also is protected because we must not forget that for the educator, that person is exposed to 30 students at a time and each time he goes into a new class, he's still exposed. Similar to other places in the world, there are those in Mauritius who are hesitant to get vaccinated for various reasons. They can get around the vaccination requirement by either presenting a doctor's certificate stating they can't get vaccinated for medical reasons or a negative PCR test result dating back no longer than seven days. But for most Mauritians, they're grateful that on a continent where vaccinations are scarce, they have the chance to get the jab. 
I just turned 18 in April and uh, as soon as I turned 18 I made it my priority to do the vaccination here and uh, I think it's very important to, to do the vaccination as uh, doing so help uh, will help keep me safe as well as everyone around me. While the rate of vaccination across Africa currently stands at just 1%, Mauritius is making steady progress towards its target of vaccinating 60% of the population by the end of September. And no doubt these new regulations are going to contribute to hitting that target, making Mauritius a true beacon of hope for the continent's fight against COVID-19. Liu Feifei, CGTN, Mocha, Mauritius. Well, it's time now for us to take a show break and return. More news, including. China issues a white paper on the practice of the Communist Party and respecting and protecting human rights. And the Democratic Republic of Congo postpones the return of the remains of its independence hero, Patrice Lumumba. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climate and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. about your life at that no. particular time? Not at all. The FDA is going to be What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to power itself. Excuse me. <laughs> Welcome back, you're watching Africa Live. Well, a new white paper published on Thursday details the Communist Party of China's role in protecting human rights, both domestically and overseas. Experts on the issue have been speaking about how China's interpretation of human rights differs from the Western model and how this is contributing to the lives of people across the world. CDTN Sun Ye has more. The white paper sums up what it says is the key to its years of human rights improvement, putting people first. All the while the Chinese people's sense of fulfillment, happiness and security have increased, scholars say the practices have also contributed to the concept of human rights. The development of human rights in China has surpassed the narrowness and limitations of Western interpretations. Abstract concepts have replaced more concrete and vivid ideas of human rights, which is a manifestation of a modern concept for our civilization. We have always viewed human rights from a historical and developmental perspective, so it conforms to reality. This has opened up a new path for the development of human rights. The white paper says China has contributed to the development of human rights through more than just existing mechanisms. I think we can also look at the matter more broadly. We've put forward ideas, for example, building a community with a shared future for mankind. This is clearly related to human rights protection. China's participation in the Paris Agreement, its promotion of global health governance, 
including the global fight against COVID-19. These are all broader ways of protecting human rights. Experts also say China's miracle of human rights improvement also offers lessons for the future, that human rights development is only possible when there's a strict observance to the law and a full grasp of reality. Sun Ye, CGTN, Beijing. Launched in 2017, Kenya's Mombasa-Nairobi Railway is a key infrastructure project, which is part of the country's modernization drive. Built and financed by China, a key pillar of the project has been the transfer of knowledge. Robin Nagila caught up with one of the beneficiaries of this program. Let's take a look. 28-year-old Emmanuel Otieno is a train conductor on Kenya's Standard Gate Rail Line operating between the capital Nairobi and the coastal city Mombasa. Otieno is responsible for a team of 13 staff on board the train. I usually receive the train in the morning at 7. I have to check all my facilities in the coach. I check the, um, the emergency hammers. I take the fire extinguishers, uh, the train number cards, and also my team. I have to ensure that everything uh, uh, is in place for them. I assign them their duties. As the train departs the station, Otieno is now responsible for over a thousand passengers. Our passengers are our first priority. That is the one thing that we learned from our training. So we have to ensure that our passengers are comfortable. In case there's any issues inside the train, then it's my duty to ensure that it is well resolved. <laughs> he interacts with passengers, answering their questions and ensuring their comfort. The maximum speed is 120 kilometers. Yeah, for the cargo is 80 kilometers. Emmanuel's worked as a train conductor for the past four years. Taught at the Railway Training Institute in Nairobi by Chinese instructors, he says he's carried on parts of his training to his daily life. That is something that I've also adopted in my social life. So yeah, time management, that is the best thing I can say I learned from the Chinese. A first-class ticket costs $30, while a second-class seat is $10. For passengers, the SGR has transformed how they travel. It's safe, fast and efficient. The reception is very, very positive from the passengers. Uh, they enjoy the service on board. They find it very, very uh, satisfactory. At the next train stop, a passenger is running late, but makes it just in time. I just bought, just bought. The train must run on shuttle. The cooperation between Kenya and Chinese, it has really, really been of uh, a good impact, especially to us as the youth. We have gained a lot of technical experience with them during those four years. For many travelers, the SGR is more than just transport. It's an experience. We see a lot of animals there, the zebras, uh, we see gazelles, um, uh, the elephants. So we also see good animals there, the monkeys, even I can see some right now. 500 kilometers later, the journey is over. Six hours after we left Nairobi, we're now in the coastal city of Mombasa. And this is not even the express train. Hard to believe, not too long ago, the same journey took between 12 and 15 hours. Robert Nagela, CGTN. Mombasa, Kenya. The owners and insurers of the giant cargo ship that blocked the Suez Canal in March say they have reached an agreement in principle with the Canal Authority. The initial agreement comes after three months of negotiations. Egypt had initially asked for more than $900 million in reward for dislodging the ship without any harm to its body. The grounding of the Ever Given interrupted the world supply chain after it stood in the way of some 422 ships. The Ever Given, the ship that blocked the Suez Canal entirely for six days three months ago, could soon be released from Egyptian custody. Egyptian authorities say they've made an initial agreement with the ship's company over the compensation it will pay the Suez Canal for its successful rescue mission and to compensate for the loss in canal revenues it caused. Egypt has been seizing the ship and most of its crew since March 29. That is when it dislodged the Ever Given after freezing navigation completely in the canal. Negotiations with insurers and the ship's owner failed repeatedly during these three months. 
Initially, Egypt wanted more than 900 million US dollars for rescuing the vessel without damaging its body and saving its load of 18,500 containers. After the Japanese owner offered 150 million dollars, the Suez Canal Authority decreased its aspired amount to 550 million. But that too was not acceptable for the cargo ship's negotiating team. Neither the Canal Authority nor the ever given representatives have officially announced the final bill. Negotiations to finalize the initial agreement will begin next week. The Ever Given could be finally free to head to its final destination in Europe once its owner makes a down payment to the Suez Canal Authority. Adele Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. The Democratic Republic of Congo has postponed the return of the remains of its independence hero, Patrice Lumumba. The country says that postponement is due to an increase in COVID-19 cases. A large nationwide ceremony had been planned for the end of this month. However, President Felix Tshisekedi has moved it to January of next year. With the details, here is CDTN's Krista Jambinga. The return of the remains of Congolese independence hero Patrice Lumumba has been delayed due to a surge in coronavirus cases. Belgian authorities were supposed to hand over a tooth believed to be Lumumba's only remains this month, but the event was postponed to January next year. Many Congolese are nonetheless excited to hear that the Belgian government has agreed to hand over the remains of their first prime minister. We've won the battle because Belgium has accepted to return Patrice Emery Lumumba's remains. The person who kept his remains was a Belgian officer who was sent to work in the Congo. He is the one who killed him. The Belgians ended his political career and his life. Patrice Lumumba was assassinated in 1961 by Congolese rebels backed by Belgium for his anti-colonial stance. In 2002, Belgium admitted responsibility for its part in his killing. His body is reported to have been dissolved in acid by a Belgian police officer. Only his tooth is said to have been recovered and kept by the Belgian officer's family. Some Congolese activists say the decision to return the tooth is not worth celebrating. We are not happy to hear that a criminal, an assassin, is returning Lumumba's tooth instead of his body. This is an insult to Congolese people and Africans in general. We will continue putting pressure on the Belgian government until it returns his body to us. The DRC government had planned a large ceremony to honor Lumumba during the country's independence anniversary on June 30th. But a third wave of COVID-19 infections changed that plan. Very large crowds were expected to attend the burial of the remains of Patrice Lumumba in the capital, Kinshasa. The city has the highest number of COVID-19 cases. The event has been postponed to January next year, when the country will mark the 61st anniversary of Lumumba's death. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. We turn our attention to Kenya now. For decades after the end of colonial rule, many elderly veterans of the Mau Mau uprising say they are yet to receive compensation for years of torture and abuse. The Mau Mau in the 1950s fought against British domination until Kenya's independence. CDTN's Daniel Arab Moy spoke to one of the movement's surviving members. Jen Muthoni is one of the original claimants in the Mau Mau compensation case against Britain. She estimates her age at between 82 and 86. Like many others, Muthoni endured mistreatment under British colonial rule during the Mau Mau insurgency. They subjected us to forced labor without basic hygiene and amenities, diseases, and other degrading treatment, including a loss of dignity and frequent beatings. In 2009, Jane Muthoni traveled to London alongside other war veterans to seek justice. In 2013, Britain apologized and accepted to pay compensation to veterans like Jane Muthoni, who was arrested and detained for three years. The settlement for 5,228 claimants was to the tune of over $31 million. But more than eight years later, Muthoni says she is yet to receive any compensation. She never got the money because there is nothing that she did with that money. And we could see if, if the money was there, we could have noticed because she could have done something here. 
Muthoni and her grandchildren say they will continue to follow up with the authorities for a positive outcome. The Mau Mau insurgency from 1952 through 1960 helped to accelerate Kenya's independence. During the uprising, some 150,000 Kenyans were held in detention camps in what was then British East Africa. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, I'll be standing by to bring you more news, including the latest from the world of sport. But for now, let's take a look at what's happening in the world of business with Rama. Thank you very much, Anna. Here's what's coming up in business news. In business, South Sudan is launching its first oil licensing auction with five blocks on offer. And high food costs are pushing 7 million Nigerians deeper and deeper into poverty. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's start the segment in South Sudan. Africa's youngest country has officially launched its first oil licensing round. Five blocks are on offer. The Petroleum Ministry says that this round aims to attract interest, hopefully from a diverse group of foreign investors. Available blocks range in size from anywhere between 4,000 to 25,000 square kilometers. South Sudan gains almost all of its government revenue from oil sales. It's been boosting output in a bid to reach pre-Civil War production levels of anywhere between 350 to 400,000 barrels of crude every day. On to another oil producer. High inflation, mainly driven by soaring food prices, has pushed 7 million Nigerians into poverty. as according to data from the World Bank. In a new report, the lender is calling for urgent measures to contain inflation and protect livelihoods. Nigeria's year-on-year -year inflation rose to a four-year high of nearly 18.2% in the month of March. Food prices have been rising relentlessly and they accounted for over 60% of the total increase in inflation. The World Poverty Clock, which uses data from the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to monitor progress against poverty, reports that Nigeria has at least 41% of its population, that's about 87 million people, living in extreme poverty on less than $2 every day. On to East Africa, where the International Monetary Fund has approved the disbursement of $407 million for Kenya as the latest tranche of the country's $2.34 billion loan. The approval comes after the fund completed its first review of the 38-month program. Kenya's total disbursements from the program now come to about $715 million. Kenya plans to narrow its fiscal deficit for the year starting in July to 7.5% of GDP from an estimate of 8.6% in the fiscal year, which ends next week. The forecast assumes that the government will achieve an economic growth rate of roughly 6.6% this year and increase tax revenues as well. East Africa's largest economy expanded by 0.6% in 2020 as the pandemic choked off investment and cut jobs significantly. The IMF sees Kenya's GDP growth this year at around 6.3%. South Africa's central bank is likely to hold off on raising interest rates in 2021, and that's despite headline inflation reaching a 13-month high in May. According to Statistics South Africa, inflation rose by 5.2% year-on-year in May compared to 4.4% the month before. That was the highest inflation reading since November 2018, driven up by transport, food and non-alcoholic beverages. Now, most economies say that the spike is due to prices normalizing from unusually low levels in 2020, of course, as the pandemic roiled the economy. 
South Africa's largest beer producer has put its capital spending plan back on the table for the next fiscal year. Last year, South African breweries cancelled capital investment plans worth over $350 million following the government's bans on alcohol sales. That was among measures that the country imposed in order to curb the spread of COVID-19. From Johannesburg, here's Sumitra Naidu. It was a massive blow to the economy when SAB canned its capital expenditure program. The beer maker found itself losing billions in dollars in sales following the liquor bans. SAB has reconsidered its position and is now going ahead with its investment plans. The plan is to continue to service the demand in the market, right? Uh, you know, the, the impact was is, is now being felt on our balance sheets. You know, we obviously needed to, to borrow to fund um, the times when we weren't earning any revenue. This investment is part of that recovery plan. You know, we are just going to need to trade trade our way out of this position. And obviously, provided we continue to trade, you know, we see we see a, a, a way forward out of the financial position we find ourselves in. SAB will spend $142 million in the 2022 financial year on upgrading existing facilities, new equipment and product innovation. Part of the spend will also go towards empowering small to medium enterprises. What this investment will do is it will um, create jobs for the economy. Uh, yeah, both the investments itself uh, will create jobs uh, as, as we implement the investments um, across our business. But more importantly, in the long term, it, it will create jobs through our value chain. Uh, we source uh, more than 95% of all of our imports locally. When SAB Miller merged with Anheuser-Busch in Bev back in 2016, one of the conditions was to ensure capital investments and retaining jobs. Authorities also required AB InBev to invest $65 million over five years. All these conditions were challenged in court after the announcement of the third ban on alcohol trading. I think we've all learned a lot through the pandemic, both ourselves as industry and, and government. But you know, there's no doubt, you know, through through these structures that government has put in place, we have seen engagement with government through those structures. And obviously, we're a large organisation, so we we constantly are engaging with the different uh, departments within government, um, and, and and we have seen an improvement with regard to um, discussions uh, as to how we should should be dealing with the pandemic. SAB currently has the capacity to brew 3.1 million litres of beer annually. This figure will increase substantially once upgrades and expansions are complete at operating facilities. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. The South African Revenue Service has destroyed thousands of boxes of illicit cigarettes worth roughly $1.2 million. Now, these particular cigarettes were either imported into the country or manufactured illegally. As the GTN's Yulisa Jamela now reports, authorities are intensifying their efforts to crush the illicit cigarette trade in South Africa. The South African Revenue Services customs officials have scored several victories in the fight against the trade in illicit cigarettes. Earlier this month, customs officials at Bay Bridge Border Post began to destroy previously seized illicit cigarettes with a total value of about 2.1 million US dollars. SARS has destroyed <clears throat> cigarettes from a number of seizures carried out across the country as a result of non-compliance detected, including in particular smuggling, ghost exports, counterfeit cigarettes. This is in line with our living mantra, and I quote, make it harder and costly for those who are not complying without, without following our relevant laws. The seizure and destruction of illicit cigarettes is part of government's efforts to generally deal with illicit trade. Illegal imports, and illicit trade activities in cigarette and tobacco also affect the local industry production, marketing chains, and legal sources of employment, as well as hindering the government efforts to attain public health objectives. A 2015 study by World Health Organization, WHO, estimated that one in ten cigarettes consumed 
in the world come from illicit trade. According to SARS, illicit imports reduce the revenue the country collects, revenue which is needed for the government to provide basic services. It destroys local industry, leading to factory closure, job losses, and erosion of the legitimate tax base. Some of these goods present a public health hazard, putting strain on the healthcare system. It also contributes to higher levels of criminality. SARS Customs has now established the National Rapid Response Team to tackle what it considers major areas of risk. Yuli Sanjo Meda for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Back into West Africa now. The decision by Nigeria's federal government to have all social media platforms in the country be locally registered has triggered widespread criticism. Now, this comes, remember, in the week, uh, or rather, uh, at least a fortnight, in the wake of the f June 4th decision to suspend Twitter's operations in the West African oil and gas giant. For the last three weeks, the social media network has been mostly unavailable in the country, except if you're using a VPN to get access to it, if you're one of its 39 million users in Nigeria. On the 5th of June, the Nigerian government indefinitely suspended the operations of Twitter in the country. The state said the social media platform poses a threat to national security. Just days earlier, Twitter removed a post by Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari that threatened secessionist groups in the country's southeast. We are simply suspended indefinitely the operations of Twitter in Nigeria. And we did that because we've seen that Twitter has lent itself as a platform of choice for separatist agitators who are agitating for the dismantling and disintegration of Nigeria. Following the suspension, the government announced that social media platforms must register in the country and pay taxes. Nigerian Information Minister Lai Mohammed says the new regulation is also aimed at curbing the spread of fake news and not a knee-jerk reaction. In 2018, we started an advocacy program through which we visited every media house in Nigeria, warning them about the dangers of fake news. And that especially in a country like Nigeria, where we have plural values, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Hausas, we have Igbos, we have Yorubas, we have Shakilis. We have people of different values. Now, what fake news does is that it exploits this fragile relationship and to set one part of the country against the other. But it got to a state that realized that the issue of advocacy would not work. We must regulate the social media. There has been an outcry about the negative financial implications of suspending Twitter in Nigeria. The country is set to lose up to six million dollars daily. Today is the age of technology. Technologically driven conversation businesses are happening. You don't need to be in one office for you to be able to advance whatever you want to do. So it is true that businesses have been affected. It is true that Nigerians have lost money. What they are trying to do is not in the interest of Nigerians. They are not trying to make any money. What they are trying to do is to gag free speech and uncontrol the narrative. So those who are criticizing us for trying to regulate the social media so understand that there's a difference between regulating social media and also and free speech. All we are talking about, the quality, the content of the media must be healthy, not just for government, even for the people. Nigeria though Africa's largest economy is facing its own internal challenges. For over a decade, the country has been grappling with an Islamist insurgency in the north, together with frequent inter-ethnic conflicts. Recently, kidnappings for ransom have been on the rise in the northwestern regions.
Joy Kiruki Juma, CGTN. Now, the median price of existing homes in the United States went up by close to 24% on an annual basis in the month of May. According to the U.S. National Association of Realtors, this marked a new historical peak of over $350,000 for a house. This is also the biggest year-on-year -year price increase since at least 1999. Now, the price increase comes amid relatively high buyer demand, but also very limited supply, a new supply, that coming onto the market. Sales saw a fourth consecutive month of decline in May. According to the Trade Association, that is a signal that they're seeing signals a return to pre-pandemic levels. Somewhat related to that piece, prices of various goods across the U.S. economy are going up. Now, one of the areas that has seen a very steep price increase is lumber. In fact, you might say that the cost of wood products has gone through the roof, and that is making new homes and home improvement projects significantly more expensive. CGTN's Hendrik Sibrandi found out firsthand. My backyard fence, you can clearly see, needs some work and not just a new coat of paint. In fact, a new fence may be in order. But is it something this journalist and his modest budget can afford? I decided to consult someone who does nothing but fix and build fences. Eric Panetta is putting up a new one in Brighton, Colorado, and says wood has been pretty hard to find. I had a job a couple weeks ago. I couldn't find lumber. I had to look around at different lumber yards. Demand for lumber, he says, far exceeds supply right now, which can only mean one thing higher prices. For example, the 4x4s, you could get it for like 20 bucks. Now you're looking about anywhere from 30 to $45, um, depending where you go. According to Random Lengths, a wood products industry tracking firm, lumber prices are up 67% this year and up 340% from a year ago. I believe because of the whole COVID thing, you know, everything kind of just stopped, shut down. The pandemic caused lots of people to work remotely from home. And that's led many of them with time on their hands and money in their wallets to turn to home improvement projects. Lumber tariffs had already caused price increases. Then lumber production slowed on the assumption the pandemic would cause housing demand to drop. Instead, home building fueled by cheap mortgages took off. How would you say this has affected your business? I can't quote people for too long. I got to constantly keep them within two to three weeks because even the lumber yards, if I ask them for a quote, they tell me the quote's only good for a week. That's assuming they have wood at all. You call one place, they don't have it. You call the other one, they don't have it. You call the other one, they don't have it. It's so early in the season that it's just kind of like, what's going on? Like, when are we, you guys gonna get it? And nobody has an answer. That lumber scarcity, Panetta says, doesn't usually happen until much later in the season. It will take a while for lumber yards to replenish their stocks and for prices to retreat. Anybody that, that thinks that it's gonna go down, I don't really believe it, uh, but. You think it's here to stay? It's here to stay. The National Association of Home Builders estimates surging lumber costs have added more than $35,000 to the price of an average new single family home in the past year. And that fence of mine, I may watch the paint peel for a while as I wait for this market to calm down. Hendrix Abrandi, CGTN, Denver. Price inflation in the real world. Uh, time for a short break at the moment, but first, here's what's coming up at the top of the hour. In global business, we'll be going back to Nigeria. Lawmakers over there are racing to pass a long-awaited legislation in order to reform the country's petroleum industry before the current parliamentary session ends in mid-May. But remember, this is a bill that was first introduced in 2008, and it's still not yet passed. Why? We'll be live in Lagos with some answers. See you then. For now, back to Hannah. So looking forward to that, Rama. Well, let's take a show break and return your sport news, including... Sebastian Ogier takes the lead at the safari rally flags off in Nairobi. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, find your game. Africa Live, find your voice.
And after the latest in sport, Frenchman Sébastien Ogier took a narrow overnight lead as the World Rally Championship returned to Africa on Thursday with Kenya's Safari Rally. The seven-time WRC champion and reigning title holder starred in the super special stage in Nairobi as action got underway following a colorful flagging off for the event. TDTN's Mahia Mutwa has more. After a 19-year hiatus, the WRC returned to Africa with a bang with the start of the 2021 Safari Rally in Nairobi. Competitors had a feel of the event billed as the world's toughest rally during Wednesday's shakedown that featured 14 drivers before the action proper of the sixth leg of the 2021 WRC zoomed off on Thursday. It all started with a ceremonial flag off at Nairobi's Kenyatta International Conference Center, officiated by President Uhuru Kenyatta in the presence of the FIA President Jean Todd. The drivers then tackled the 4.84 kilometer super special stage at Kasarani, with Sebastian Ogier topping the time sheets in 3 minutes 21.5 seconds, only three tenths ahead of Toyota Yaris teammate Kale Rovan Pera. It's been a good test for sure, but uh, it's going to be a very long rally, so uh, we have a lot of question mark of the condition we're going to get, especially on second pass probably. Where Road can be very, very rough, but we don't really have, uh, yeah, we don't have experience here. So uh, it's going to be difficult to find the right rhythm, but I think the car is good, so I'll try to be as clever as I can. Yeah, nice special stage. Uh, it was quite dusty out there, so I was a bit stuck in the dust. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a very little appetizer only from what we will get during the weekend. So the real rally starts tomorrow, and uh, that's what we are looking forward to. The local drivers put on a show in the Super Special, but they were no match for the WRC cars and crews. This time now, it's, it's, the conditions are different now. It's not wet. So, and it's a lot of dry dust, powder. So let's see. It will be very, very interesting um, come the end of tomorrow. With the ceremonial start and opening stage out of the way, the drivers head to Naivasha for the next stage of action from Friday. The event has already gripped a nation and captured the hearts of the continent. Mahia Mutua, CGTN. In the Euro 2020 in Group F, a late Leon Goretzka goal was enough to salvage a point for Germany and a place in the last 16 